This is the second time we've invited David to share with us. The first was OER's professional development webinar, where David and several NIE colleagues helped us think through how we could capture and communicate the evidence of research impact in our Singapore uh, education context. So just to kind of um, you know, highlight, um, the, the focus that we have has been partnerships and, and thinking about impactful partnering with different stakeholders in the system. Uh, the focus has been on knowledge mobilization. So trying to mobilize uh, different kinds of knowledge resources, engage people uh, in, in some of NIE's research for evidence informed policy and practice and also research impact. So those are really kind of the three pillars that we want to, to emphasize. So um, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand the time over to David. Uh, David, and thank you so very much for being with us uh, today, this morning, which is evening for you. Thanks, David. It is, it is evening and it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Mark, uh, for this invitation. Thank you, Lorraine, for helping set everything up. Thank you, all those who were involved in making today happen. It is a real pleasure for me to join you in my second engagement with um, NIE. And so it's um, thank you for bringing me back. That I'll take that as a win. I'm going to share my slides. And I will just want to make sure that um, you can see them. Hang on. Mark, how does that look? Great. Great. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about partnering for impact. I mean, it, it, Mark set it up a little bit in that the last time I talked, it was about collecting and communicating the evidence of impact. But underlying all of that tool that I that we worked on together was really the role of partners that was in um, that is in this work. And so we really want to drill down a bit more in this session to the partners. And I do want to I, the majority of participants, not all. But the majority of participants in the first session were NIE researchers, but we are absolutely welcome MOE folks today. If there's anyone from the Academy of Singapore teachers, welcome. Anyone else who's a non-academic partner, and I'm going to use that term non-academic partner because it distinguishes and differentiates your vital and important work from the role of the academic partners. So I've got, I'm going to open with two polls, and uh, they're, they're slightly different. The audience of the first poll is going to be any academic in the room, anyone from NIE um, in the room is going to be the first poll, and I want you to check all that may apply. So Vivian, could you please launch the first poll? And what I'm asking the academics in the room is to check all that you may have applied. Vivian, if we could get the first poll up, thank you. So have you ever posted about your research on social media? Have you, if yes, click one. Also, if you have in addition collaborated or worked with a non-academic partner, click on two. And you can click on one and two at the same time. If you've spoken about your research to a non-academic audience, so including the public, have you given a public lecture? Then you'd want to click that one. Have you contributed to media release about your research? Have you spoken to media on TV or radio? Have you served on a non-university committee because of your expertise? This might be a committee at the community level, might be a committee in MOE. Have you sat on a public or community or government panel relating to your research? Number eight, don't forget to scroll down. Have you done arts-based dissemination? Maybe you've done a comic about your research. Maybe you've done some poetry or anything else that takes you beyond publishing and papers. So we're just gonna give you a little bit of time, click all that may apply. And I can see the answers are coming in. So far, 27 people are responding, 29, excellent response, 32, 31, 33. Thank you, all of that. I'll give you another 10 seconds, and then we'll take a look at, um, at what people have done. Okay, lots of folks are answering, up to 42 folks. So Vivian, could you please close the poll? And I think everyone can see the top one is that 71% of the respondents, 30 out of 42, have collaborated or worked with a non-academic partner. I'm thrilled at that, that's amazing. Um, following close behind, many people have spoken to a non-academic audience. And we can see that some people have done anything else. So it'd be interesting if you want, if you answered number nine, I encourage you to put an example in the chat box to tell us um, what is the anything else that you might have done. 
So this is really important. My, my, I look at this and it's really encouraging to see of the 42 people who have responded to this, many of them are doing some work that takes them beyond their academic research. And whether that's partnering or that's on the road to partnering, this is a very encouraging result. So I'm going, to, I'm going to close this. So if everyone could close the poll, the first poll on their screen. And now Vivian, I'm going to ask you to launch the second poll. And this is the poll for non-academic audience members, people from MOE, anyone else who's here. And Vivian will launch it. And again, similarly, this is for, for your audience. Have you ever collaborated or worked with an academic researcher? Have you written? with an academic researcher. It might be an academic paper, it might be a blog or a journal or, or an article in a magazine. Have you co-presented with them at a, in, a, in an academic or non-academic um, setting? Has an academic ever uh, consulted you, phoned you up and asked for some, some input? Have you ever spoken to a university class? You've come in as a guest lecturer. Or maybe you've reached out to a university and saying, hey, I'm looking for help for information or resources. Number seven, have you sat on a university committee? And number eight, is there anything else that takes you into a space where you bump into academic researchers? So remember to click all that may apply. And we're seeing the numbers starting to come in. So far we've got 29, 30, 32 people responding. Thank you very much. We'll just give it maybe another 15 seconds. 41 people have responded. So that's an excellent response rate. Thank you very much. We'll take it to one minute 20. So five more seconds and we'll see. And this is interesting. So Vivian, if you could pause the poll, please. And the top, um, the top again, similarly is 84% of um, the respondents, 37 out of 44 have indicated that they've collaborated with an academic researcher. So my message here, I'm actually gonna, um, so thank you very much. Also following close behind, you, um, sometimes they've consulted you. And again, there's 22 of you have done something else that has taken you into a space where you bump into an academic researcher. And again, I invite you to put in the chat, what is that something else that you have done? Now I'm gonna invite everyone to close those polls. I thank you for your participation. I, sh I, I ask you these questions because this is like bridging the gap. This is, you've got academics on one side, non-academics on the other side of, a, of a, an artificial divide. And it's very clear that by doing some of these activities that you're helping to bridge the gap, you're helping to come together into some shared spaces. And we'll talk a little bit about what that, what that looks like. But whether it's from a point of engagement where you're starting to reach out or as a point of collaboration, and again, very pleased to see that there are academics and non-academics who are already working together. So my message for, for, the, for many people in the room is, you're already doing this. This isn't one more thing that NIE or that Ministry of Education is asking you to do. Many of you are already doing this, these, this work and these activities, and these can underpin the impact that the research is trying to have, both academic research impact, as well as impact on policy and on professional practice. So I've taken a quick uh, look at the NIE strategic vision. I'd love to know how many other people have read your strategic vision for your um, National Institute of Education. And it's really enabling of the work that we're talking about today. Partnerships matter to NIE and they matter for education in Singapore. So I've just highlighted and read some of the text from the NIE strategic plan and that the research at NIE helps to inform education policy and contributes to the enhancement of learning and teaching. Those are the impacts that NIE wants to see from its research. In the second paragraph, you establish, extend, and deepen collaborations and impact with key stakeholders and strategic partners. So these collaborations, which are underpinned by partnerships, these are fundamental to the work of the National Institute for Education. And at the end, NIE wants to make a positive impact on the quality of the teaching profession, teaching practices that, turn, that in turn enhance the quality of learning in our schools. So it's in the DNA of NIE to want to work in partnership in order to have an impact, positive impact on teaching and learning in Singapore. 
And we do this by working in partnership. I'm gonna illustrate very quickly a model that for those of you who were at the Professional Development Day a few weeks ago, we talked a lot about this model called the co-produced pathway to impact. But the logic of this is that, that we do research as the first bubble on the left, and then that research is disseminated. And then somebody takes up the results of that research and they evaluate it. And if it's any good, then they're gonna implement the, the evidence into policies or practices and services. And it's those policies and practices and services that have an impact. That's the last, um, uh, the last of the five on the right-hand side that have an impact on the lives of your, on the, the stakeholders, whether they're learning outcomes in the classroom or policies in the government. And so this pathway, as you can see, there's a space for academic researchers to do their things in the red on top. And there's a space for policy or practice partners to do their thing on the bottom, but all the way through up until the impact, there's an opportunity for academics and policy partners to collaborate, policy and practice partners to collaborate all the way along that we can do co-produced research. And many of you have indicated that you've worked in collaboration. All of that research can be disseminated in academic forums, but also so it can be disseminated to policy and to practice partners and to the public as well. And then the policymakers or the teachers might take up that evidence. And if it's good, they'll implement that into their practices. And notice that the impact comes out of the partner space. And I say this because our researchers don't make products, industry does. Our researchers don't develop public policy, government does. And our researchers don't tend to deliver social services, community or, or civil society organizations, organizations do that. So if we want to set up our, our research to have an impact, we do that by collaborating throughout the process from research to impact. And again, I could, uh, there is a paper we published and that is available um, through, through your library. So here's a, about seven suggestions for helping support collaborations. I'm focusing it from the context of a grant application, but it really is meaningful for both partners who will be working together because you can consider it as a project that's not necessarily funded through a grant application. So please don't be a Mr. Know-it-all or a Mrs. Know-it-all or a Ms. Know-it-all or a Dr. Know-it-all. Um, one of the things that we do in the Knowledge Mobilization Unit at York University is we try and partner researchers with our non-academic partners, but most of the requests for partnership come from the outside. And they, they phone up the Knowledge Mobilization Unit and say, I'm looking for the following expertise. And we work with them to help um, identify what the expertise they're looking for. And then we go and try and find a researcher to have a conversation with them. And the first thing we say to the researcher is just remember you don't know it all. And academics are really comfortable being the experts in the room, but we explain the expertise of lived experience, the expertise of policymakers, the expertise of practitioners in the classroom. And it's not about supply and demand that the university has knowledge and other people don't. It's about finding those complementary knowledges that fit between academic expertise and the expertise of, of practitioners or policymakers. So don't be a Mr. Know-it-all or a Dr. Know-it-all. Don't work to the last minute, especially if you're doing a grant application. This comes whether um, a researcher is looking for a partner on a grant application or when a policymaker phones up and saying, listen, the minister's got to figure this out tomorrow morning. Can you get me a literature review? Right. So try not to work at the last minute. One of the things that we're trying to do is encourage um, authentic relationships. These are relationships between in meaningful co-produced fashion. So they don't work if you work at the last minute. And if you work at the last minute and you're writing a grant application, all you're going to get is a love letter. You're just going to get a support letter that doesn't have any meaningful contributions to the project. And so we want to avoid love letters. And if you have to write, if um, the government's being asked to write for um, a letter of support for a grant application, then you really want to make sure that the letter is meaningful and has contributions, specific contributions to the program. So we want to avoid love letters. We also don't want to be a miser. This is a message to our academic colleagues. Um, we're, and, and I can't speak from a university perspective, we're really good at holding on to money. And it's really important that if we want to collaborate, especially with, um, with parent groups or teacher groups or community organizations, that we find a way to share the funding with those partners that really don't have a lot of funding themselves. And again, this is a way of sharing power and building authentic relationships. Those are the things we don't want you to do. The things we do want you to do 
are write a good impact strategy, whether you're applying for a grant application or writing a proposal for funding from another source. I'm not gonna walk through all of these elements of your impact strategy, but you will see that the first is the partners and the audiences. Who are you working with? Because you can have all the goals you want, all the activities you want, but if they're not being done in collaboration with partners, then they're only going to be meeting the needs of one half of the equation. So getting out there and engaging with partners back and forth is really important to underpin your type of research. And uh, Lorraine, I think, I hope you will PDF these slides and make them available to all the participants so that these, um, these references are available to the, to the participants. Yeah, here's okay. something I also, oh, thanks Lorraine. Here's something I also want to encourage you to do. Not all partnerships are created the same. And so I want you to segment your partners. So some of your partners want to work with you. They want to collaborate with you. They're the co-production partners. They're the ones in blue. They're a subset of a larger group of partners, which are your audiences and your receptors, the people that want to receive your evidence. Some of them have been the people collaborating with you, but some of them want to receive your evidence anyway. So they're your receptors. And then everyone is a stakeholder. You want to listen to your stakeholders. You want to disseminate to your audiences, but you want to work with your co-production partners. And so think about your partners differently. And because the different role that a partner organization makes in your project, it will be a different activity of how to engage with them. The other thing we want to um, look at is this is called the Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Engagement. It's where do you place your partnerships? And this is done from a community-based research point of view, but it works for policy research, works for research and professional practice. And at the bottom end of the ladder is non-participation and tokenism. And up at the top is citizen power, the power of your partners. What we often do as academics is we think of, let's have a partner advisory board or patient or public involvement. I, I won't tell you what the CIHR um, strategy on patient-oriented research is, but often we will talk to call our policymaker or our teacher partner a collaborator or partner. And that's okay, but it gives them accountability without any authority. But where you can have accountability and authority is if you provide your partner maybe a position on the board that is governing the project, or maybe they're co-chairing that board that is governing the project, or even if you're applying for funding, can you make them a co-applicant? So find a way to move up the ladder that gives partners, academic partners and non-academic partners shared accountability and shared authority over the, over the project. And then finally, I'm just going to say what's next. For this, go back to the co-produced pathway to impact. What I didn't mention because I was saving it to this slide is that stakeholder engagement underpins all of the activities for partnership. You can't partner before you've engaged. You've got to get out there and you've got to talk and you've got to engage. And I'll illustrate this story by this guy. He's the man in motion world tour, Rick Hansen, a Canadian who is living with a spinal cord injury. He's a wheelchair athlete. And in between the two years, between 1985 and 1987, he wheeled around the world, literally through 34 countries. I have no idea if he went to Singapore, but we can find that out. And he raised awareness and raised funding for people with disabilities and spinal cord injury. And when he came back to Canada, he set up the Rick Hansen Institute. And the first thing he did was stakeholder engagement. He talked to um, experts about what should be the priorities for the Rick Hansen Institute. And he spoke to clinicians and to, um, to academic researchers, and they said, you need to focus on neuroimaging and biomarkers. Those are the most important things. And then he spoke to people living with spinal cord injury and their families, and they said bladder control and erectile dysfunction. Those are what you have to work on. If we only talk to the air quotes experts in the room, the academics and clinicians, you're only gonna get part of the story. We have to work on biomarkers. We have to work on neuroimaging, but we also need to work on uh, erectile dysfunction and bladder control. And so that was the stakeholder engagement that rounded out the priorities for the Rick Hansen Institute. So I'll just close with coming back to the way you can bridge the gap. And as we show, showed in the polls, many of you are already doing this, is by getting out there and doing engagement with media, doing engagement with the public, and then collaborating, co-presenting, co-authoring, and presenting to government or to teachers or to researchers, basically bridging the gap between the usual place of policy or practice of non-academics and the usual place of scholarly research of academics. So I'm gonna pause there.
And Mark, I'm going to turn, close my slides and I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, David, for a very thought-provoking presentation. And um, I think we're, uh, want, we want to encourage participants to engage with David. Um, David talked a lot about engagement, so this is a, an opportunity to ask some questions. And uh, you have Slido uh, that, that you can ask those questions through, and then we'll put that on the screen and, and try to uh, get to some of the questions. But thanks so much for your presentation. Um, I think for me, um, you know, I think, I think you highlighted that we're already doing this. Uh, we see the emphasis on partnership and stakeholder engagement in NIE's vision. And, uh, you know, we, we do have some very strong partnerships. We work very closely with MOE, with AST, and, and so on. And I'm wondering, uh, just, I guess, based on what you know about us so far in terms of our, uh, you know, six-month-long or so engagement, um, you know, in, in, in conversations and so on, um, what, what do you think is, would be important for us to think about or do to kind of take it to the next level? How do we enhance these, these sort of partnerships and build on them and extend them for even greater uh, you know, partnership and, and, and impact? Uh, any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I do. Before I go to my thoughts, thank you for that. I just want to thank folks who have put in the chat some of their other things that they've been doing. I encourage the participants to look in the chat because there's some interesting um, examples of, um, of where academics and non-academics have, have worked in together in other contexts. So I'm um, going to the next level. Well, I think number one, um, Number one is the strategic plan for, uh, for NIE, and I think that has clearly articulated, as you have indicated, um, the, 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 the aspiration for impact of research and through, uh, through partnerships. So that would be number one. You don't have to do that. You're already doing it. Number two, you've got your researchers already working with partnerships. What I like that you've done is, um, is you, you've got not just researcher individual to partner individual collaborations, but it feels to me like you've got the NIE as an organization has deep institutional partnerships with the ministry, with AST. And that's really important because individuals and projects come and go. But if you've got the institutional partnering down, then those will transcend, um, transcend any um, number of the individual collaborations. So I think you've got the both. Um, let me ask you, does, um, does Singapore have a tenure system at your university? Do you have tenure and promotion or do you have career progression? We, have, we do have tenure and promotion on the professorial track and, and then a, a parallel uh, system of promotion uh, on the lecturer track as well as the research scientist uh, track. So it's a, yeah. Right. So that, that would be one place that I would say to look at. I don't know what yours is looking like. And maybe that's a conversation Mark and Lorraine and others can have. Um, not now, but at another time is what does it look like? What are the incentives and rewards for researchers to do this work? Right. Um, and similarly, on the ministry side, uh, what are the incentives and rewards for ministry folks to be able to be doing this type of work? And it works for AST and other partner organizations. We need to we need if there is an aspiration in the strategic plan of NIE, then there should be some um, supports for researchers, some some uh, incentives for researchers to do this work. Yeah. Um, secondly, and I think you've got to start on this. We're not ex researchers don't grow up being experts in this space. Right. And so what are what what are the um, services and the the services that um, NIE is going to be able to offer to its researchers? And so I think you've started that you've got a knowledge mobilization unit and um, and really kind of, um, again, thinking, how does that unit connect to more local structures? And because um, I think the unit is uh, how many people is Lorraine plus one or two, I think. A few more. Yeah. A few we, more. OK. Have, good. We, yeah. We have, uh, so you true. build some you build some capacity, yeah. which is great. But you know, um, the NIE is a big institution. So how um, how is how does knowledge mobilization not begin and end with Lorraine and her team, right? Yeah. That Lorraine and her team. And this is this is really important because um, I've been in many situations where researchers have said, "Okay, I'm going to do the research, and then we're going to pass it on to Dave, and he's going to do the mobilization." 
And we really need to be thinking about research and mobilization and impact all at the same time. And the role of Lorraine and her colleagues is to support and to build capacity, but the, but the mobilization, the impact has to happen alongside of the research project. So I'll just pause there because I yeah. could fill up the rest. Yeah, of no, thank time. you. That, that, that's, that's very helpful. I think, I think those incentive structures are really important. I think it's everything from appraisal to promotion and tenure kinds of structures, but it's also perhaps, you know, funding, funding opportunities to do this work by researchers with yeah. collaborators at, at MOE. And, and I think, yeah, I think that it, in terms of the knowledge mobilization unit, I think we are trying to, um, you know, spread that work across NIE, but also reach out to different uh, stakeholders, but also different people who are interested in the knowledge mobilization work. We also have a school partnerships unit too, that, um, you know, engages uh, different school partners in the system. And, you know, we work, try to work closely with AST and, um, mm -hmm. you know, our, our corporate research office and so on to make sure that the research is being uh, translated and, 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 and used. Um, I think, I wanted to see if there's some questions on Slido, and I think they were going to show that slide so that we can get a couple of questions from the participants. Um, yeah, so how, I guess the first question, which has had the most votes, is a difficult question. Um, how might you communicate unflattering findings about partners to the public without burning bridges? So sometimes... I think as researchers, we try to provide a critical perspective and, yep. you know, we're, we're looking at that critical perspective and we think that it's important for us to be critical friends, but, you know, it's also quite sensitive too, in terms of how we communicate this with our stakeholders, but also to the public. Mm -hmm. So how might you uh, respond to that question? I, that, that, that's a, a good question. And it's um, not surprising that it got the most number of thumbs up. So uh, what I would, um, first consider doing, especially if you've been working in partnership with that unit, with that ministry, with that individual, is um, go and talk to them first. Right? Don't blindside them or throw them under the truck with your research findings, but talk to them, get their perspective in this, because ideally what would be nice is that you've got unflattering, or I'm going to change the word unflattering to critical, right? Because critical can be negative. It can also be positive um, because you critical being you want to help them, if it's unflattering, you want to help them find a way to get better. Um, and, uh, and it would be great if the researcher and, and the, the partner were able to have a joint presentation, say, this is what the research says. And the partner can say, well, I've listened to that. And this is what we think, or this is our perspective. Um, but recognize, and this is interesting, is um, the role of evidence in decision-making. And I was presenting with um, the Deputy Minister of Education in Ontario like 15, 16 years ago. And, and he said, David, just remember that evidence doesn't vote. And that evidence is, is one input into political decision-making. And there's many other inputs. And so it might be that you found something and it's just not taking root in the way that you, the researcher, would like to see it be used, but recognize that your lens is only one of many lenses that politicians are, are responding to. And so um, we, we need to manage our expectations as academic researchers, the, the, the role our evidence um, can actually play. And, you know, we don't have to look, well, in Canada, we don't have to look further than, you know, south, south of the border to see the role of ideology over evidence in political decision making. Yeah. Are you referring across your border with the United States, I think, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let me be clear. And not the current yeah. administration, the previous one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think the, uh, the other question that got quite a few votes was, uh, you know, we, we've already addressed somewhat, and that's, you know, sort of this idea of um, making sure that partnerships and knowledge mobilization is built into appraisal systems and that there's incentives um, in, in, in these sort of performance assessment systems that we have. And I think that's something that, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we hope to work on. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge that question. I, the, the second the second question that I want to raise is, uh, I think, a combination of a couple that I've seen. So that one problem is that stakeholders may be keen to do evaluation studies, but academics tend to come from a more theoretical kind of conceptual perspective. And in order to win a grant, you need to have a strong theoretical and conceptual uh, foundation for your study. And then the other question, if I remember uh, 
let me see if I can find it there, um, that sometimes teachers and schools may not be as interested in research as we would hope they would be. Um, I was just reading some articles on evidence-informed uh, practice uh, in the UK, and there's a lot of talk about just, you know, different discourses between academics and teachers. Teachers, it's, it's much more practice-oriented, practice-focused. It's based on sort of practical wisdom, and researchers are coming at things from a much more, again, sort of theoretical and, and maybe conceptual uh, perspective. So I just wanted to, to kind of, uh, and again, it's kind of a jumble of a couple of things there, but I wanted to see how we can manage those different discourses, kind of bridge them. You talked about bridging in your, in your yep. uh, keynote. How might we bridge those? Because we tend to have different needs um, uh, and, and, and interests and perspectives, I guess, and, and knowledge bases. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a, so evaluation can be research, but it is often more along the lines of consulting. It's more, I've got something that needs to be done. Could you do it for me or do it with me? Um, and I don't know, again, how your institution looks on, on consulting, but some, some organizations, some universities have that type of work as valued for uh, career progression. So that would be coming back to the career progression. What I'd say, though, is we had an opportunity to do some evaluation work. The request was for evaluation for a unique model of social service agencies delivering services to victims or families coming out of situations of family violence. And what they did was they, they looked at, well, we could do it this way if you just want us to evaluate, but it, we, they theorized the unique structure of these organizations and they came up with a new evaluation methodology. So creating the evaluation methodology was the research. Actually doing the evaluation was something that also made it into the published papers, but it was also, but, and that, that meant that met the goals of the agencies. So I think about um, evaluation rather than just saying, I want to evaluate whether uh, how the impact, impact of A on B, you could do that, but try and look at it as, um, as a research project and what else around there might you also be bringing in to be able to do an evaluation, maybe raise the awareness to um, your ministry colleagues that there's maybe different ways to think about evaluation. Um, so that's the, the specific one. What was the second part of the multi-part question? I guess the second part is sort of bridging this uh, gap between researcher discourse and teacher right. discourse, which is much more practice oriented, focused on problems of practice, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Do you know, one, one thing that, m one of the opportunities to bridge the gap, um, do you have graduate students, Mark, at NIE? Yes, yep, we right. do. So, yep. so graduate students, especially those at the master's level that aren't necessarily committed to a, um, to a PhD academic career, Getting those students, finding some way of sort of experiential education or work-enabled learning where, um, where they're often being supervised by an academic, but they're working in the ministry or working in the context of the, of the research. And, and they might be an interesting um, mediator between theorized uh, academic research and practical applied um, knowledge creation that needs to happen at the ministry level. Yeah. Thanks. And I think I think having, you know, those collaborators from schools and from the ministry on board right from the very beginning when research is being conceptualized and and even in terms of some of the research questions that we ask, um, I think as researchers, they could be much more sort of practice focused and, and this idea of really focusing on shared problems of practice and, and policy and, and seeing that, you know, we're bringing different sorts of lenses and expertise, I think that can help all of us better understand these problems and, and to think about how these problems might be better managed. So um, yeah, I, think, I think that sort of front ending, uh, you know, the, the partnership and collaboration around the, the research is pretty key, I would, I would guess. Yeah. yeah. I think so. 